Hello, no pipe support line. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, what we can do is we can um, we can do a search for organisations in your local area. Um, I can also send out information to you if that would be useful. Okay. Well, NAPAC is a confidential service. For me to have a look in your local area, all I need is the first part of your postcode. We don't store any of the data at all, and it is completely confidential. Alternatively, I can give you the website details, and you can search for this information yourself. With regard to the information pack, all I will do is write your address down on an envelope. That envelope will then get sent to you. Okay, we don't keep a record of anything, um, any contact details for you at all. It is purely confidential. There's lots of information in the information pack. There's, um, there's some help sheets on um, different types of abuse. Uh, there's some useful organisation details in there. Um, I can also send you some booklets that we've we've developed as well, um, about blame, um, about not being on your own, and um, some common feelings for, that survivors have. Does any of that sound useful for you? Okay, I'm more than happy to send that out to you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I can do that for you yeah. now. In 2000, the NSPCC did a survey on 2,864 18 to 24 year old people and found 6% of children experienced frequent and severe emotional maltreatment during childhood. 6% of children had experienced serious absence of care during their childhood. A quarter of adults surveyed had experienced physical violence during childhood. 31% of sexually abused victims still hadn't told anyone of their abuse by adulthood. I, I founded NAPAC because I was abused as a child and when the, the memories of abuse came flooding back to me in my late thirties I couldn't find any help, I couldn't find any support, there was no charity to support a male survivor of abuse, not that I was aware of anyway, and there was certainly no national focus for adult survivors of child abuse, no national charity. Um, children have Childline, NSPCC, Bernardo, Save the Children, all sorts of charities for children, but for an adult abused as a child, I couldn't find anything, and so I decided to set no pack up myself. It's been very helpful to me, and also to realise that you're not the only one that it happened to, and I've discovered subsequently that you know millions of people in this country were abused as children, both male and female. Well, when I was 12 years old, I was at a family party and everyone was drinking and they put us to bed, all the kids to bed. And I ended up sharing a room with one of um, my parents' friends' son. He was two years old. And his father came to tuck him in. The boy was sleeping and he came over to my bed and I was just pretending to sleep because so I just was a bit confused as to why what he was doing. And he started kissing, like stroking my face and kissing my neck. And I, tr I didn't know what was happening, so I sort of rolled over as if to pretend that I was sleeping. And then he just sort of pushed me down and he started touching me all over. And I. I don't know what happened. I just I didn't know what to do. I I couldn't I couldn't scream. I I couldn't do anything. And then he then he raped me. Sexual abuse involves forcing or enticing a child or young person to take part in sexual activities. The activities may involve physical contact or may involve non-physical acts involving children in the production of sexual images. I don't know. I've always been like a boisterous child and I'd sort of found the strength. I, d I don't know where it came from. I just hit him and like he, he sort of jostled and I hit him really hard in his face and then he stopped and then he left. 
And I just remember going to my mum and my dad and I told them what happened. I knew it was wrong. I told them straight away what happened. And they approached him. I, went, I wasn't there at the time, but they approached him and they, they got the police involved. Well, we, we have a few key objectives. The, the, the main one is, is to support adults who have been abused in childhood. We don't actually offer counselling or therapy. We simply offer support, moral support, a listening ear. We send information. Um, the mere fact that people can share their, their memories or their pain with, with someone else who understands is a huge step forward for, for the survivor. Um, but we also try and raise awareness generally about the effects of abuse. We have plans for the future to organise conferences. We have plans to organise support groups for survivors of abuse. We've got lots of plans, it's just, it's just the resources that's holding us back at the moment. From when I was five till I was about 12, I was physically and mentally abused by my dad. Um, like All sorts of things really happened to me. Uh, there was times when he decided to drag me up the stairs by my hair, and that even caused like hair to actually just pull out of my head. Uh, there were times when he would just throw me across my room, um, and, and then he would just hit my leg for some reason, for so hard, and it just stung really bad. And um, there were times when I was born prematurely, so spent like the first year of my life in hospital making sure I was all right. Um, but I had problems with breathing. Uh, so then this one time he decided to almost pin me down and just stand on my chest. Um, <laughs> he got off when I started the choke, which is nice of him. Um, just, yeah. There was one time he decided to uh, hit me and, and just hit my nose, and he said I deserved it, and no reason why. Um, there were times when he he threw me uh, from one end of the room to another, and I hit my head so hard I thought it was just going to pop, um, and that gave me a headache for ages. And um, I recently like, I found out that because this all happened whether my mum was home or not, and I found out that she got abused as well by my dad, and so did my sister. Physical abuse is where physical harm is caused to a child. This may include being burnt, hit, drowned, or poisoned. Uh, there's one night that sticks in my head particularly. Me and my dad were watching TV and uh, it was Children in Need Night. Um, an advert came on for NSPCC um, and it showed sometimes uh, some sorts of abuse that children have gone through. And then so my dad turned to me and joked, going, I did that to you. Then he had a special nickname for me, which was Gay Boy, and he knew it wound me up, so he keeps saying it and saying it, and then... Um, I acted really violently, and then he hit me because I reacted to what his name, the names he called me as. <sighs> How can you really explain? You can't really put it into words, but I felt horrible. It was like he used to, he used to say I deserved it, and for a while I believed him. Um, but there was things I learned that I, I could never be true to my feelings or express my feelings because I thought he'd hit me. So I, I was very much like I didn't know how to feel about it. Um, obviously now I feel really hurt and it just felt not just wrong and really hurtful to me. Um, and it's been really hard to like explain it to people. Emotional abuse may involve conveying to a child they are worthless or unloved. It may involve verbally abusing or scaring a child. Um, there was one time I said to my dad, if you ever hit me again, I'll report you. And he said that he would kill me if I did, if I told anyone. So that kept me for quiet for a while. But um, when I was 20, I finally um, found courage to report it. But there wasn't enough evidence to go to court. Uh, so it felt like I wasn't believed or like it didn't really happen. But that, that was quite a blow to me because like, no one actually believed that it actually happened. But oh, all because there wasn't enough evidence to support it. But what we do know is that child abuse as a crime is incredibly hard to prove because by and large there is a victim and there is a perpetrator and there are no witnesses because it happens behind closed doors. So often it's one person's word against another. Um, mitigating against that, of course, many abusers will have abused more than one 
child. And so if you can, or if the police can actually get a number of people together, hence the, the idea of trawling and trying to find witnesses to the crime, then if you can get people who can corroborate the crime, then there is a better chance of actually getting it into court. But in terms of percentages of abuse cases that end up in court, it is tiny. It's tiny. It's probably less than 5%. And again, we're talking 5% of an unknown quantity in a way, so it's yeah. difficult to put figures against things because, you know, we know, again, from our experience that most abuse isn't talked about and um, it, 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 it makes it a, a very, very, a very tricky one for the police and the Crown Prosecution Service because they will only take, the CPS will only take a case to court if they consider that they've got more than a 50% chance of getting a prosecution, otherwise they would see it as a waste of time. And, you know, I can understand that because it's, it's public resources. Well, after my mum and dad, when they tried to get the police involved, before they could even start investigating, the bastard committed suicide. I'll never forget that day when my dad sat me down and told me what had happened and I just felt as if he had got away with it. He took the easy way out. He didn't want to stand up in a court of law and he didn't want to feel that shame, that guilt. I mean, I wanted to go in, I wanted to be there, I wanted to stand up and say what that paedophile did to me and I didn't get the opportunity. I can't even count the numerous nights that I cried myself to sleep and if I think about it, I can't cry about it anymore. I just feel this anger, just a, a deep anger, like deep inside. It's just almost a rage. And it's a rage that I have to try and contain and to deal with. It's not that unusual for um, a child abuser once they are apprehended or imminently about to be apprehended and prosecuted that they will, as I see it, take the easy way out and, and kill themselves. And it is a pattern that we, we, we've seen over the years, and um, you know, which is a tragic end to a life. But my, my sympathy lies with, with their victims rather than with them. And, um, and in, in a way, you know, when somebody takes their life in those circumstances, they, they are, in a sense, denying their victims justice still because the victims will never get the hearing. You know, they will never be able to, if they want to do it, they will never be able to stand up in a court of law or anywhere and say, this person did this to me and I accuse him and I want him punished because suicide isn't a punishment, it's just the end of life. Well, afterwards, I felt empty. It's quite hard to put into words how I felt because I, in all honesty, I just felt as if I, I wish I could have just disappeared. <laughs> Going to school and being around my friends and they were all happy and normal and I just didn't feel that way. Well, I've always had the support of my mum and dad. The, the, They've, they, well, they try to understand, they've tried to, I suppose, comfort me. Um, I mean, I'm 21 now and obviously with time, I can't say it gets better because it's always there. It's, it doesn't matter how you try and block it out, it's always at the back of your head and sometimes the smallest things can just trigger, just take you back to that moment. Well, I'm I'm doing art therapy at the moment. Um, that's really helping. I mean, I've always been a creative person and to be able to just express my emotions through art, I can honestly say it's helping me. Um, I think I'm ready to have counselling, but I just don't want to go to a doctor's. I, I don't want to go to a doctor's and, ask, and tell them what's happened. I, I'd rather, I don't know, find a charity or someone or people that understand what I've been through and 
know how to deal with these situations. There are some good uh, clinical psychologists around. We, we know a few. Um, again, it's an area where there hasn't been enough training in the area of psychology and counselling and therapy to, to actually work with survivors of abuse. So much abuse goes very, very deep. It's a very complex trauma when a child is abused. And a lot of training is, is done to deal with the here and the now. You know, people go for a bit of counselling because they've lost their job. Maybe they've, um, they've suffered a bereavement, so they've been drinking. Counselling is very good at, at touching the surface and kind of dealing with those issues. But where childhood abuse is involved, it goes, you know, it goes to the, the very heart and soul of the person. And, 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 and childhood abuse is, 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 is something that is, it needs more than six sessions of counselling. It needs deep understanding and appreciation of the damage done and how to help people to, to move on and heal. And that's very much what we at NAPAC want, want to help people to do, is to, to move on and heal. Um, for the past four years, I've been seeing a uh, psychiatrist, and um, <laughs> I know it's, it's not going to be an easy fix. <laughs> I wish it was. There's always like constant memories going through my head, especially with my mum being here. Um, but uh, that's really it. I think, apart from being there for my family as well, like all, all my family have been there for each other since like my mum kicked my dad out, um, and that sort of helped us. But yeah, the psychologist is the main help I've been getting for four years. But it's not going to go anywhere. It's obviously being abused and it's going to stay with you for a while so hopefully I'll, it'll feel better in the long run. For, for the past 12 months we've been averaging around about a thousand calls a week. Um, we can only ever answer maybe 10% of those at the very most. Um, but we also know that a lot of people go onto our website and get information from our website, we get emails and letters from people, we get a lot of emails from people saying that they've been able to get help simply by going onto the website and finding out information. Um, abuse, child abuse and, and survivors of abuse will t tell us about feelings of isolation, of feelings of being very alone with, with, with the pain and the memory of, of, of abuse. And NAPAC is very much about Bring, bring, bringing people out of that isolation, breaking those, those chains of silence, if you like. So I think we're helping many more people than we're actually having kind of personal contact with, if you like. And as more people hear about NAPAC, the response is always very positive. It's always, I'm so glad you're there. I never knew. I always felt so alone. I don't feel so alone anymore. Thank you. And, you know, we're, we're like a bit of a a growing family really and, and then I think that people who visit our office can, can kind of sense that that atmosphere that, that we that we are you know we, we care about each other and we care about survivors of abuse and, and we try and we try and put ourselves around in, in that in that sense. So you know in, in terms of literal numbers we're we're maybe only helping hundreds of people each month. But in terms of people we're reaching out to and touching I, I think it's Probably considerably more than that, and when we have media exposure, we know that we are we are we are touching people's lives and helping them simply by by speaking out. It happened from a very young age. My dad, my dad was an alcoholic, and we both found well, both me and my mum were subject to a lot of abuse, both physical and verbal. I mean, I'd find often I was coming coming to school, even, even at primary school, with large bruises on my arms and things. I was just too embarrassed to say, too young at the time as well, to say what, where, where it's coming from. I, it, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to talk about even now. Neglect may involve a parent or carer failing to provide adequate food, clothing or shelter. Failure to protect a child from physical and emotional harm or danger through inappropriate supervision and failure to provide medical care or treatment. Um, yeah, I'd, both, both my parents would work as much as they could and there would be times where I'd be left 
unfortunately I'd be left at home on my own and I couldn't make, I, I just couldn't get any food so I'd go days at times starving and my mum my would do her best but she lived in fear as I did of my father coming home from work and just he, he'd go straight to the pub after work, have a few, come home and just beat us. During high school I began to try and find a release from obviously all the abuse that I was having at home and unfortunately from it I fell into a lot of bad habits and bad crowds. I start it started off just with like cannabis, just having parties and things that would be started but it slowly spiralled out of control and I was I didn't want to go home and I found myself night after night I spent weeks at a time crashing on friends sofas as much as I could after parties or just going over try to stay I was going from girl to girl and try to stay at theirs but they all found what started on just cannabis soon spiraled to just high oh, drugs I start, found myself on uh, heroin even a few pills at times and even my close friends they they saw what was happening to me but they I see it now they were trying to help but at the time I I feared I was come, now that I was becoming more and more like my father I was getting angry with them and I s felt I was pushing away everyone I ended up just on my own and when I it, when I was finally just kicked out of the last place and I spent months just on the streets and that that those are just months I would rather yeah it was hard I think government could perhaps do more to acknowledge publicly acknowledge the extent of the problem of child abuse and and, and by implication the numbers of people that have been abused in the past and it's something, I, th I think it comes down to, to, to government are reluctant to acknowledge something for fear that they will be expected to put their money where their mouth is. And therefore it's easier to avoid it. And, and so survivors of abuse are often left high and dry. I think it was... After, after a while, I, I mean, I would do everything I could to scrounge money just to get my next fix. But there was only so much you can scrounge, and and only so much people give you the looks from everyone passing by. I think that's where it started hitting me, and where I started not being able to get what I need, or what I felt I needed from the drugs. I just, I was searching, it was like within me, and just trying to get people to almost. I was asking for help from whoever I could. I would get the from other people that were on the streets I found through charities. I would talk to that there were other people saying the big issue. I would talk to them and try and find out what they've done to turn their lives around. And eventually I was just pointing the rough direction of charities that can uh, that were able to help me and eventually I was I came across one they would put me in contact with NHS counselling and they were able to help me off the streets for a while and see a few counsellors but that was even that I found hard because it's it's just so so hard to come off it and trust anyone after what I felt I'd been through they really I, I'm sure they weren't but to me no one sounded sincere and the, I feel the NHS they would they only seemed they seemed happy as soon as I was with someone, they they didn't really particularly listen. I felt after when I said, "Look, I can't. I don't feel I can trust this counselor." I, they listened, but I'm not. I'm not comfortable talking to them, telling them my stories. I don't. And eventually, I it helped as much as I could. And I could tell them to a certain point, but eventually, I had to just look around myself elsewhere for another. For someone else, and eventually I was able to find find the right person for me. 
and they they've helped so much in the in the last three years I've turned my life around in leaps and bounds there's the charities out there that can help you um there are people out there anyone you can talk a number of people you can talk to um psychiatrists or charities um even if it's just sometimes a chat with someone who it could be just a, like even in a cafe just the normalest place in the world but if you have someone to talk to it's really helpful because at least you're getting your feelings out and your side out it's just find someone to talk to there's load there's lots of places out there that is uh, that are open for people um no matter what's happened to you and they're really friendly and really they really listen to what you have to say um i'm absolutely 100 percent certain that, that this charity benefits and supports and helps and has helped a lot of people i'm not saying we don't get things wrong occasionally and i'm sure we do and i'm sure we always will if we're human but by and large i would say that maypac has done a, a huge job in, in raising awareness around the issues of surveillance of abuse and child protection um, but also su supporting supporting those survivors yeah. now i suppose i feel I mean, I'm at university and it's far away from home, so it's sort of, sort of, I've sort of removed myself from the situation almost. I mean, I'm sharing a room with three girls and they're all really lovely, and just, just being away, it's helping me, and being around people that don't know, and that, you know, just that whole fresh new beginning, it's. It's helping me to grow as a person and to sort of be normal. I, th I, th I think, in a nutshell, my message is don't let your abuser win. Um, and the best way to, to do that is to lead a good and healthy life, is to live for the future, is to deal with the past and put the past where it belongs, which is in the past. And these are things that are easier said than done very often. But we believe that there is healing and there is recovery. And we know many people who are living evidence of that and, and do lead good lives having had a bad, bad start. So, so our, our message is one of, is one of hope and, and standing together and, and speaking out. Because by speaking out about what happened to us, those who are able to do it, we're actually helping to protect today's kids, and I think that is just as important. Like, <laughs> I mean, I look at all the girls that I share my room with, and they're just so happy and so normal. Normal, Like, that's what I aspire to be. I aspire to be normal and happy. If you have been affected by any of the issues raised in this programme, please call the National Association for People Abused in Childhood on 0800 085 330. For more information, please visit www.napac.org.uk.